Hello, everybody. Welcome in to another episode of the Couch GM's podcast on Friday, September 17th, 2021. The three amigos are here to give you everything you need to know for week two. We got your host, George Kurth, here with Tyler Snyder. Tyler, do a little jig there, I see. Yeah, you know, trying to get uh, get pumped up for this podcast, really bring the heat today. Bring the heat. I like it. And Cody Roadcab. Cody, what do you have to say negative about my intro today? I'm not I'm not gonna say anything about you. I'm gonna talk about Tyler's trying to get pumped up, but that was probably the most uninspiring pump up speech I've ever heard. So <laughs> hopefully you have a little bit more energy coming for the rest of the show. Yeah. <laughs> off to a great well, start. Well, there's nothing else. That, yeah, we're you off to what? a great start. <laughs> you know what? My pump up speech might not have been that great, but you know, if you were giving a pump up speech, people would be like, What is he saying? Are those even words? He stumbled like eighty seven times and I can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> No, Thank we'll just you. go back to the episode that he was hosting and I wasn't here. And he was like, welcome in to the Couch Jams podcast. Well, let's get to some news before we get a who are too far off the rails here. We got to talk a couple of headlines that hit before or since our last podcast back on Monday. And that would be first off Raheem Mostert. We talked about him as missing about half the season with his knee injury. He has come to the conclusion that he will get season ending knee surgery. What does this mean now for the 49ers guys? This, I mean, we expected to see a lot of changes in that backfield, but now the entire season. Well, George cut out a lot there, but what he was saying is that Raheem Mostert is out for the season now. And what does that mean for the 49ers backfield? Um, I think it means a lot for Elijah Mitchell who was the hot waiver wire ad of the week. Um, it might also mean Trey Sermon finally gets to suit up. If he gets to suit up and gets the play, maybe he'll be able to shine a little bit and, hey, maybe earn his way into that backfield, earn some playing time. Um, we'll have to see how it shakes out because, you know, the 49ers backfield is always a question mark. Um, but, George, we did post it a little bit on social media, but to anybody listening out there, there was a report that Raheem Mostert's wife came out and said, guys, Please stop with the threatening messages. Uh, people were sending death threats and saying, hey, kill yourself, all because Raheem Mostert is out for the season. And there's no place for that in football. It's it's a game. I mean, you're playing fantasy football. Uh, this is real people with real lives, real careers that they are playing for. Um, first off, did you think he was trying to get hurt? As a guy with bad knees, um, Trust me, nobody tries to tear their ACL. It's miserable, it's horrible, and that's punishment enough. They don't need you reaching out to them. Um, and on a little bit of a lighter note, this might come off sounding really mean, but if your fantasy season was hinging on Raheem Mostert to the point where you're willing to send death threats, you probably weren't going to win the league anyway, if we're being honest. Because <laughs> Raheem Mostert, it's not like he was that great of a running back this year. Completely agree with that, Snyder. Again, and if, if you are sending death threats, uh, and like he mentioned, if that was the hinging on your league in week one, uh, just put all the players on your bench, log off fantasy, and leave the fantasy community because we don't want you. We don't want people out there sending death threats to players. We want to support these players even when they're not on our favorite team. We like to cheer on these guys that help us when they don't care about our fantasy team. It's a game for us couch GMs, people that are – in their basements, in their living rooms, watching football every Sunday. If you're going to send a player a DM, say, great game. Man, I love watching you play. What you did for the community was so important. Leave all the negative stuff behind. Agreed. Everyone spread positivity, especially in times like this, but all the time. We don't need any of that. Um, so great words by you guys uh, to bring us back around to a little bit of advice here. Um you guys are right. It means a lot for Elijah Mitchell, and we will see what happens with Trey Sermon. He should be active this week. We'll see if he gets any carries. They also did sign Trenton Cannon, who was recently cut by the Ravens. Trenton Cannon's a special teamer. He's not really going to factor in, I don't think. Um, but it's kind of a wait-and-see scenario here for the 49ers. Why don't we move on here to our first COVID concern well, hold on, of the George. season? 
Hold okay. on, George. Uh, that Trenton Cannon signing might not seem like a big deal uh, because, you know, Trenton Cannon, I mean, he had a couple snaps in the Ravens game this past week. He looked OK, uh, and he's probably going to slot in as wider or running back number three or four. He might be a gadget player, but the cutting of Trenton Cannon did free up some space on the Ravens depth chart. And it is worth noting that not Le'Veon Bell, the guy I was expecting, but Devonte Freeman was signed to the Ravens active roster. Uh, and will likely play this week. It's interesting to me. I really thought Bell would be the guy that would outplay um, Freeman, but it looks like Freeman has earned the job first. Bell is still there on the practice squad, so um, we're going to have to see how that Ravens backfield shapes up, but I thought that was worth noting that Devontae Freeman is there. Very true. That is very true. And, yeah, I think it was a pretty even split between – the two other backs on that um in that committee there last week but Tyson Williams and um Latavius Murray Latavius Murray seemed to get more of the carries near the end of the game but we'll see if Devontae Freeman starts to factor into that at all and maybe make it a messy enough committee that none of them are going to be fantasy relevant it's a wait and see scenario there as well you're right um back to the first COVID concern of the NFL season, the New Orleans Saints have six assistant coaches. I'm told not coordinators, but lower level coaches and one player being wide receiver Michael Thomas test positive for COVID. Obviously, Thomas is not a concern to your fantasy team. He's still on the PUP list. He's not going to play for a few more weeks at least. And the Saints coaches who tested positive, I am told, were vaccinated. So there's a chance they can coach this week as long as they have no symptoms. But this is just the first outbreak of we're probably going to see a few. We're lucky this one isn't a lot of players. But does this concern you that it's week two and we're already seeing things happening? No. I mean, I think we saw last year that we're going to have to deal with some COVID issues. It didn't go away. It's still definitely relevant. Um, Luckily, like you mentioned, the coaching staff was vaccinated. Uh, Actually, one of the Packers assistant coaches end up testing positive for COVID two today. Uh, there's no, there, none of them were considered high contact when they played that game in Jacksonville last week. So there's no, not saying that they're correlated, but it is interesting that they, those two teams played and those are where some positive tests are coming from. Um, but it's just something you have to deal with it. And I guess that's probably a good time to remember, make sure you're with your fantasy leagues, you're communicating with your commissioner, with your other league mates. As of right now, no games are projected to be canceled, but make sure you have a plan in place. If a game is going to be canceled. Uh, Last year, you know, we talked about how you post on your league's message board, on a Facebook group, in a group chat, however you all communicate uh, a designated player on your bench. Uh, You have to do it before the Thursday night game if there is a potential COVID missing out. Um, Just something to keep in the back of your mind. But again, luckily, this one has no players. You know, we talked about spreading positivity. Let's spread positivity, not COVID. Absolutely. And, you know, we had some COVID concerns on the Titans roster, too, in preseason. It was Mike Vrabel woke up after a game and said he just had a minor sore throat and said, eh, what the heck, I'll get it tested anyway. And it ended up as COVID. Just because guys have COVID this year, a lot of these guys are vaccinated and the symptoms are a lot lighter um, and they are able to come back quicker or it doesn't affect them as much. We saw last year with guys being unvaccinated, getting COVID that they kind of seem to come back and not play as themselves for a little while. It did affect them a little bit more long-term. I don't think we're going to have that as much this year, so I'm not as worried about it. But like Cody said, just be active, uh, keep contact with the commissioner, and keep an eye on your fantasy team. Definitely the concern this season is more of timing of positive tests than it is actual symptoms because there is still protocol in place where if they have a positive test say two days before a game, it's going to be really tough for them to get into a game that weekend. Yeah. We saw that with Zach And then Martin we might see some one. concerns. Exactly. Exactly. So there are still, there has been, I think one other player I heard that missed a game because of COVID, not any kind of high level player, but there's, there's a couple so far. We got to keep an eye out if there is an outbreak, but I think the chances of anything like that are much lower than last year, just thanks to the vaccination rate. Um, a player that will miss week two, though, not thanks to COVID, still recovering from injury is Odell Beckham Jr. He was a surprise inactive last week in the late games for the Browns. And I guess Stefanski just decided there's not enough plays in the playbook that he's comfortable with him running yet. And he's going to cut pull the plug a little early for week two. 
are you concerned with this long term now that he's missed two weeks? Or do you think Odell Beckham is going to come back in week three or four and be the same old OBJ? Well, hold up before we say anything. Who? What is the same old OBJ? Because um, we've had that's OBJ true. <laughs> that is, you know, a fantasy stud. And he comes out there and puts up 20 points a week or more because he's just that you know, amazing. And then we've had the same old OBJ that goes out there, disappoints, disappears, and maybe gives you two points. We don't know what OBJ is. And every year when you draft him, you know, you're taking a risk. So I don't think anybody, um, at least most people did not draft OBJ this year thinking, uh, I don't need any backups. He's going to be amazing. And we're good. I think if you took OBJ, you kind of had some other receivers on your roster ready to play in case he wasn't what he was supposed to be. So you should have a backup plan. Um, however, I am a little concerned that he's out still. But to be honest with you, I think I think he'll be all right. I think he'll come back. I'm glad they're not rushing him back when he's not ready. I'd let, rather let him get up to speed, make sure that he is fully healthy, fully good with the playbook, ready to run all routes, and let him come back as that old, same old OBJ that used to put up big points and – uh, you know, I still think he's going to be a good fantasy asset this year. And if you have him, I still wouldn't cut him. Yeah, definitely don't cut him. Hold him out, you know, unless you can find an old Giants fan that still has a strong attachment uh, to him that wants him back on his team. Maybe trade him right before he gets he gets back. But I do. I like Odell Beckham a lot. He was one of my favorite targets because he was going so late in drafts. And I expect him to be back in week three. So OBJ, definitely keep and stash. Great advice there, guys. And why don't we give more advice as you break down every game in our week two fantasy outlook. First game, first game on the docket here for this week. One o'clock Sunday game. We got Las Vegas Raiders at Pittsburgh Steelers. Is there anybody in this game that you think stands out other than your obvious? Well, can I can I still say Darren Waller? This dude had 19 Uh, targets on week one. What now? Let me actually on that point. We didn't we did quotes of the week earlier in the week. I kind of wish we did them in this episode because there was one quote from John Gruden that I feel like I have to mention. He said something like, if we throw 60 passes in a game, Darren Waller should get 29 targets. If you're telling me that, then this dude, if they throw 40 passes in the game regularly, he wants him to get like 18 targets. Why did we not draft Darren Waller higher? I'm at, that's a great question. I mean, fourth round, he's was the lowest he was going, but at, at the target rate he's getting, the numbers he's putting up, I saw he's the first tight end in NFL history to have five straight 100 yard passing games. Uh, this might have been a guy that we missed out on. Everyone in the whole fantasy community, we are, you know, in all of Travis Kelsey from last year. And don't get me wrong, Travis Kelsey put up huge numbers in week one, worth where he was being drafted. Uh, but maybe Waller should have been a, a little bit closer than we had originally projected. Or maybe even above. Do we go that far? Do you think that Waller is better than Kelsey for the rest of the year? How high, how high are we on him right now? I I don't want to choose. I mean, I honestly would put them one and one. I don't even want to say 1A, 1B. Like, I just have them tied right now because I don't even know what to say to that. I, I'd still give the edge to Kelsey because of the Chiefs offense like I know the Raiders look good but the Raiders also won week one last year they looked really good and then were, they had their up and down moments I'm going to take Patrick Mahomes over Derek Carr if I'm going to pick the guy throwing on the ball so Kelsey for me would still be number one um, but Waller is, is right up there but you know everyone's starting Waller that's why you drafted him what about the other guys I know in the the Raiders game in particular the Raiders wide receivers you know Henry Ruggs flashed at the beginning. And then at that last two minute drive, it was all Brian Edwards. Hunter Renfro showed up a little bit in overtime. Zay Jones caught the touchdown. Are we still not starting any Raiders wide receivers? Is there, because Waller just demands so much volume, is there any guys outside of Waller that you're willing to start? Well, can I just say, first off, before we move on to that question, that that Ravens Raiders game, as an outsider, might end up being game of the year. That was probably one of the most fun, exciting games I've ever watched. Now, uh, hopefully my boss doesn't watch this, but I was actually on the clock at work during that game, and I was sitting in the back office doing manager tasks with the game on my phone, just 
screaming in the office because it was a really great <laughs> game. It was insane. Um, but yeah, to go with your question, you know, Brian Edwards is the guy that we were kind of talking up a little bit in the preseason. Henry Ruggs is that guy with the speed that can beat you over top. Zay Jones apparently has a couple plays in the playbook dialed up just for him. But the guy I really like is at receiver, if I have to own one of them, is Hunter Renfro. I, I feel like he had the best connection with Derek Carr. Uh, Gruden was super high on him. Derek Carr even went out. Or it was either Derek Carr or Gruden. I'm a little fuzzy on it right now, but one of them went out and said he's actually the best player on the team. He just doesn't get the recognition and or one of the best receivers on the team. It's just I think that Hunter Renfro is going to be that sneaky guy that you're going to want to own for later, that sleeper. He might emerge, especially if one of these four receivers that we're talking about goes down um, or God forbid, hopefully it never happens. But Darren Waller goes down and they have to turn somewhere else. I think he's going to be the guy you want to look at. But for right now, I'm not starting him. Stash him. Don't start him. Uh, If you're starting anybody else other than Darren Waller or Daniel Carlson, because kickers matter, um, the only other people I would be starting are Pittsburgh Steelers, in my opinion. Uh, you got to go with Chase Claypool. You got Deontay Johnson. You got Juju. Um, trying to balance out which one of those receivers is going to have a good game. That's a little tough. Uh, Big Ben, I don't love the start. He didn't really flash in week one very well. Um, however, it was a tough matchup. Bill's defense is really good. And Najee Harris is an obvious start as well. So two things. First off, uh, I know we were trying to mention which receivers. I I like Hunter Renfro uh, to get people off of Zay Jones just because Jay, Zay Jones seemed flashy. I remember a quote last year from Cody where he was like, "Oh man, that Raiders caught a great touchdown. I wonder if I can own this guy." And you're like, "Oh, it's Zay Jones. Never mind." <laughs> yeah, um, I, probably, and two, I probably did say that. <laughs> you did totally. Uh, and two, you didn't mention Josh Jacobs into that Raiders conversation. Is there a reason for that? Well, he is questionable right now. I don't want to say definitely start Josh Jacobs until we know what's going on a little more. I mean, he was hurt last game. And if you watched closely last week, you did see after quite a few plays, he took his time getting up or was hunched over or pulled himself out of the game a couple times. He's definitely feeling it. And, you know, the Steelers have a really good defense. So we have to be careful when you see a running back that's banged up going against a defense like that. Obviously, if you have Josh Jacobs, he's probably one of your starters so you're probably going to roll with him anyway if he is healthy, but he is definitely one to be a little weary of this week. All right, and just real quick on that, if he is out because he's dealing with the toe injury and their team around him isn't even sure he's going to play, Steelers defense is good. Kenyon Drake or just no? Kenyon Drake's going to be the guy or t- too much for that defense? I would put him in your... I would put them around middle rankings for running backs. I mean, if you're talking about benching one of the top guys for a Kenyon Drake, probably not. If you're talking about a potential flex play for Kenyon Drake, then probably you could probably start him in there because anytime you have a starting running back and if Drake's out, you're not going to have a lot of people stealing carries from him. It's probably going to be Drake and Drake also has the pass catching ability. So he should, especially in PPR formats, have a little bit more value as well. So if Jacobs is out, I would say Drake could be a good flex, but it definitely depends on who your roster is. So if you're listening, if you're debating who to start, reach out to us. Let us know who you're debating between, and we'll break it down for you. Another person I want to talk about here really quick before we move on is Najee Harris. And Cody, you wrote a beautiful Start Sit article for this week, and you mentioned Najee Harris in that. Can you tell us where he falls in your conversation? Yeah, if the dude has to, has to start this week, we talked about it on our Monday show. He had 100% of the snaps. Raiders gave up the most rushing yards of any team last week in week one. I think he has the opportunity, has the volume. I know he didn't produce much against the Bills, but definitely put him in your lineup. On pretty much all Steelers that are wide receivers or running backs, I'm okay starting this week. So one more question Good. before we move on to the next game. One other potential play, and I'm just honestly curious here. Um, we need to understand that it's not just quarterback running back, wide receiver, tight end in fantasy. And I know kickers aren't a big thing to Cody, um, but there is defenses. Now, the Ravens really didn't put up as many points as we were expecting, and they are a high-powered offense. Yes, they were missing their star running backs, but they Tyson Williams looked great. And Latavius Murray is still a serviceable back as well. You guys are a lot higher on him than I am, but that's a whole other conversation. 
the Ravens still have a great offense and Lamar was dropping dimes and they still didn't put up the offense we were expecting. They also were getting blitzed like crazy. Even against a shifty guy like Lamar, the Raiders were getting sacks left and right, especially from one of my favorites in the league, Max Crosby. Um, where do you guys, where's your confidence level on the Raiders defense moving forward? I don't know if I would start them in a matchup against Pittsburgh that has so many different weapons and can attack you in so many different ways. But I think they've definitely emerged more onto my streaming radar. If they're in a positive matchup, I'm going to think about them a lot more than I would have a week ago where I would have kind of glazed over them regardless of their matchup just because I don't think they were the defense that would have gotten you those sacks, those turnovers, or even held down an offense. And you mentioned Max Crosby. I was going to mention him if you didn't. If you're in an IDP league, and you need someone to play defensive line, look into Max Crosby if he's not taken, because he was an animal on Monday Night Football. Yeah, Max Crosby was an animal. Uh, I'm just going to say again, it was week one. Like I need to see the Ra- Raiders uh, prove it a little bit more before I'm hopping on their their stream tr- the stream train for the Raiders defense. And they're in a tough division, so they're not going to have a lot of plus matchups. We love the Chargers offense. We love the Chiefs offense. The Broncos, I mean, they even put up points this past week. So definitely some tough matchups there. But guys, that's probably way too much time talking about the Steelers and the Raiders. I feel like we spent 10 minutes on them. So all the Raiders fans and Steelers fans out there are loving it. So we got to spend as little time as possible on this one. And that's also because it's Georgia's favorite team, the Philadelphia Eagles. They're hosting the 49ers. We talked a little bit about the running back with Raheem Mostert and Elijah Mitchell at the beginning. Are you guys willing just to put I know I saw people, they spent 90 to 95% of their fab. Some people spent it all to go get Elijah Mitchell after week one. If you spend all that to me, that tells me you're putting them right in your starting lineup. Are you guys? I am. Um, at least until further notice. I want, like, like I said before, I want to see what they do with Trey Sermon. Now that Trey Sermon should finally be active. But there's every indication that Elijah Mitchell is further along in his development than Trey Sermon. So Sermon could end up taking carries later in the season. For now, hot hand approach with San Francisco traditionally, plus how good he looked. It should be Elijah Mitchell for this foreseeable future. Yeah, I just don't know how comfortable I feel with it. Um, I mean, I was talking to you guys before we started recording. I'll let the fans out there know that in our league of record, I have Saquon Barkley. I I'm worried about him on Thursday night football. When you're listening to this, you already know what he did. So you'll know if I made a mistake or if I made a good decision. But uh, if I bench him, do I start Damian Harris or do I start Elijah Mitchell? Now, I understand that Mitchell seems like the flashy name right now. And Harris doesn't seem like that much. But Harris had a great game and he was heavily utilized. Um, So who do I start between those two? And are either one of them worth benching Saquon Barkley over with his risk factors this week? Um, I'm not as confident as George. I'm not saying just throw him into my lineup. If I have a hole or if I don't have a flex guy right now, probably, but I'm not throwing him in there as confidently. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not forcing him in my lineup either. If he was, if Raheem Mostert wasn't in my lineup last week and I had enough players, maybe I had, you know, an Aaron Rodgers to Devontae Adams. And that's why I lost because they had like seven points combined. That's not going to win you a week. So if Raheem Mostert was on your bench, I'm not going to force Elijah Mitchell in there. If you're now on running back four because you had the Ravens guy, Raheem Mostert, I get it. Sometimes fantasy sucks that way, but now you have Elijah Mitchell and you can feel confident starting him, just not a guy you're forcing into your lineup. But, George, I want to pivot to your Philadelphia Eagles here. One, congrats. They're the only team of our home teams that got a win last week. And pretty sure if you would have said Titans, Packers, Eagles, only one of them is going to get a win. No one would have picked the Eagles. No offense. No, I wouldn't have either. Uh, but Jalen Hurts looked good. Devontae Smith looked good. Dallas Goddard seemed to have a clear edge over Zach Ertz. Who he, and now Zach Ertz is dealing with a little bit of an injury. Mm-hmm. Are you confident starting all three of those guys? Miles Sanders, too. And what about the flyer, the waiver wire, Kenneth, Gain- Kenneth Gainwell? Because people are picking him up. Would you put him in your lineup or is he more of wait and see? I think Gainwell's a wait and see. Um, There's very specific circumstances where I'm thinking about benching Miles Sanders, but in most situations, I'm probably starting Miles Sanders this week. And I'm even getting Devontae Smith into a couple of my lineups as well. 
lineup specifically where I had Brandon Ayuk and that is kind of blowing up in my face, but I'm feeling confident being able to throw someone like Devontae Smith up into that lineup. And Jalen Hurts, the 49ers gave up a lot of points in garbage time that maybe turned out not to be garbage time, but whatever, to the Detroit Lions. So I have no problem starting Jalen Hurts in against a defense that looked fairly porous in the secondary, especially if Hertz is going to use his legs less and his arms more, which is the indication we got from week one. You, you brought you up Brandon Jalen Hurts. If you have Jalen Hurts, how confident are you moving forward? Are you saying he is still a backup like he was typically drafted? Are you saying he is an every week starter? Or are you trying to flip him because I... he just had a hot week? I don't think I'm flipping him and I, I wouldn't say I'm starting him every week, but I'm probably starting him most weeks because of his ability with his legs. There's going to be some matchups where he faces tough defenses. I would rather go to my bench and grab someone like, say, a, a Joe Burrow or a Matt Stafford, who you probably drafted to compliment him because they all came around that same time in the draft. But I think most weeks, not quite all right now, I'm confident with starting Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I'm definitely on board with that. Running quarterbacks is almost a cheat code in fantasy. Hurt showed he's going to get some points on the ground, so you can start him pretty much with confidence. Uh, but you did bring up Brandon Ayuk. We talked about him again on Monday. There's something going on there. He uh, has a little bit of trust issues. You know, there. Cal Shanahan said it's fine, but you know he has to play better than the, the guy behind him because they're all taking snaps. His counterpart Debo Samuel exploded onto the scene in week one with 189 yards on 12 or 12 targets and nine receptions. But he only had a hundred and nine of those yards where after the catch, that's a pretty impressive. He had over a hundred yards after the catch. Are you concerned about Debo Samuel? Could it be a little bit too much of hype? Is this like an early trade target? Like try to sell the big week or with no Iuke, Debo Samuel's the guy like, What's your guys' thoughts on Debo? Well, with Debo, I would say I would try to flip him, just not yet. I think that Debo is probably going to play like this, play pretty hot for a few weeks until Ayuk gets his footing back. If Ayuk never gets his footing back and never really starts emerging onto the scene, then it might be Debo all year. But it's clear you need to have... It's nice to have a number one receiver on a team and... I think Debo right now is the number one receiver, even over Kittle. I'm not saying if you have both of them, don't start Kittle, but you know what I'm saying. I think that he is the number one target right now. They want to go to Debo, and I don't blame him. He's performing well. So, yeah, I would keep him for about three, four weeks, let him keep shining like this. By then, Ayuk might start emerging, and once he emerges, targets are going to go down, sell Debo at that high value that he is uh, right now and that he will be. Um I also want to say how crazy it is because I have a league where I have Ayuk and Debo Samuel and <laughs> I took Ayuk in round like six and I got Debo Samuel with the final pick in the draft as Mr. Irrelevant. So it's just crazy to see their values being so different right now after where they were being drafted. Now you must have drafted with some scrubs to let Debo Samuel go all the way to 12. And if you're on his league and you let him do that, yes, I just called you a scrub and I don't feel bad for it. George is in but, that league, and the second I took Debo, he went, oh, my God, Debo's still available? <laughs> he texted that to me immediately. So uh, you just called a fellow couch GM a scrub right there. I'm sure George has called me worse from behind <laughs> my back. Uh, but, again, let's let's move on to the next game. <laughs> the Cleveland Browns are hosting the Houston Texans, maybe the surprise of the week, how well they looked. What about Mark Ingram? 26 carries. Is he? I, I assume he made a statement that he's the guy like Philip Lindsley you can throw out, David Johnson you can throw out. None of the receivers, maybe Brandon Cooks. You guys can talk about Brandon Cooks, but is, <laughs> is Ingram the only startable guy on Houston? I, I think it's also interesting. Like, I'm pretty sure the top three fantasy scorers outside of Tyrod Taylor were all running backs. Like you say, throw out Philip Lindsay, throw out David Johnson. They actually had decent fantasy weeks, which makes no sense when you have a running back getting 26 carries. But it was game script. Are they going to have that same game script against Cleveland? No. If you have to start Mark Ingram, which I hope you don't, do not expect another performance like that. 
they might not even run the ball 26 times, let alone Mark Ingram alone getting 26 carries. So I, I want to avoid that backfield this week in a tough matchup. Yeah, you got to remember the reason they ran the ball so much was because they were up by so much. They dominated the entire game, which I don't think any of us expected, but it is still the Jags. It is Trevor Lawrence, but it is still the Jags. They're still not a great team. The Browns are a team that we were talking as a sneaky Super Bowl team. Um, Even after week one, them losing the way they did, they still handled Kansas City for three quarters. Um, And if it wasn't for a botched punt, they might have won the game against Kansas City. So... Against a team like Cleveland, yeah, I'm definitely not starting Ingram. They're going to be playing from behind. They're going to air it out more. Tyrod Taylor might be a sneaky fantasy play if you are really short on quarterbacks, um, but hopefully you're not even starting him. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Mark Ingram was running back 17 after 26 carries and half-point PPR, so it wasn't like he was putting up a lot of points. Pivoting to the Cleveland Browns, though, We know the running backs, they're both startable. Baker, he's a decent streaming option. And Jarvis Landry, he's a guy. But I want to talk about tight ends. Tight ends are so hard to find. And David Njoku, if guys even remember who that is, looked pretty good against the Kansas City Chiefs. He he and Austin Hooper, they were out on the field about the same amount of time. So I'm pulling up the stats right now. They each had... Uh, three catches and Juku led the team or led the tight ends and targets. Are you willing to start any of them and which guy are you keeping your eye on if you're not starting him this week, but maybe let's see how he does next week. Which one are you tending to lean more towards? If you have to start a tight end from the Browns, which again, hopefully you don't, I think the guy you have to look at is Hooper. He's more of your guy that's going to get the volume. I know that Njoku had more targets this week, but I wouldn't bank on that too much. I think Cooper's going to get more of the open field work. And Joku's more of your touchdown threat. So you might be able to bank on some points there. But again, it's a high risk, high reward. Um, Nothing would make me happier if guys like OJ Howard and David Njoku would get traded to a team that needs a tight end so they can finally be utilized as a number one. I'm so tired of there being three tight ends on this team, three tight ends on the Bucks, and they never get work because of it. I'd love to see what they could actually do, um, but short rant over. Yeah, I'm not looking at Njoku yet. Maybe I'd pick him up and stash him on my bench because he's probably available most places uh, just in case he does break out. But I do not feel comfortable starting any Browns tight end just yet. I agree with that. Um, I think the person that I tend to lean more towards is Njoku just because I feel like he hasn't seen that kind of volume since he started having his little I want to get traded rant last year. And I think he's the more explosive of the two. Austin Hooper's kind of the old reliable, but I think Njoku has the better chance of making the big play consistently. So I'm watching him, but right now you're right. Hooper's probably the safer play if you have to start somebody. All right, you heard it here first. We're split. Tyler is Hooper. George is team Njoku. Njo- wow, Njoku. That'd actually be a really <laughs> cool name. But anyways, yeah, that's not his name. It's Njoku. Um I'm not going to make my decision uh, because I like it being a 50-50 split. <laughs> Next matchup, this is probably the matchup that's the hardest for me to evaluate any of the players on the team. That's the Denver Broncos at the Jacksonville Jaguars. No Jerry Judy, Tim Patrick, KJ Hamler. James Robinson only had eight <laughs> touches in week one. What's that about? Or like... For me, I'm trying to avoid this game at all. Like we, I don't even need to know that it. Like I'll see the score on Sunday night. Good. I don't want any players on this team. Maybe Melvin Gordon. He looked pretty good in Week One, but I know Javante had a lot of carries too. And it's a tough one for me, guys. What do you guys think on this matchup? Any players stick out to you? No offense. Oh, no that's a, that's a really good one. He's the one that I would start with confidence. I would think about starting KJ Hamler or Tim Patrick if you're wide receiver desperate at this point, but the only person I'm starting with confidence is Noah Fan. Yeah, I am wide receiver desperate in the league, and I am starting Tim Patrick in the league, so I feel like if you have to start one of the wide receivers, that's the one I like the most. He's underrated. He's not talked about enough, but he's always getting targets. He's always getting catches, and uh, he's a touchdown waiting to happen, but yeah, other than that, 
uh, I'm avoiding this game, just like Cody said. I'll see the score later. You know, if you have to start somebody from the Jags, the guy I like the most is DJ Chark. But even then, I'm not thrilled to throw him into my lineup right now, the way that they're looking. All righty, let's, let's move on. That one was short, sweet, and hopefully you're not a team full of Jags and Broncos. Uh, next up, New Orleans Saints, Carolina Panthers. I don't want to talk about the Saints. They they destroyed my heart for opening week. They have a lot of talented players. I put Jawan Johnson as a sit in the article this week. I mentioned he only had three targets. Two of them went for touchdowns. Adam Troutman is a guy I like. He led the team in targets. Jameis Winston. I know some people are iffy on because he had five touchdowns, but 148 yards only. What are your guys' thoughts on the Saints offense? Is there still too many young and new pieces for you to figure that one out? I think so. I'm avoiding their wide receivers because I still am not confident on where the targets are actually going to fall long term. I think if you have one of those borderline quarterbacks and want to start Jameis Winston this week, this isn't a bad matchup, but I'm not super confident with it. I think you can play way worse, though. Um, Other than Alvin Kamara, I think Winston's the next most confident. I don't want to touch any of their wide receivers quite yet. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning of the season, we were talking, oh, it's going to be Traquan Smith. Oh, it's going to be Marquez Calloway. And then all of a sudden it is, hey, it's Jawan Johnson. Like, what? (laughs) It's just their team doesn't make sense yet. Um, And like Cody said last week, I mean, Jameis Winston had five touchdowns, but really didn't have any yards. Like, they, they, Kamara carried him down the field, and then it was... Winston just threw the touchdown in. So are you even feeling confident in any receiving options at that point? Because they're not always going to do that. Sometimes it is going to be Kamara. That's just going to get the ball handed to him for that touchdown. So yeah, like they said, I'm avoiding it. Um, going on to the other team, you got the Carolina Panthers and I love that, you know, Darnold looked good. I, I really think that Darnold has been underrated for years. I think he had a bad situation with the jets and I'm glad that he's looking pretty good there. If you have to start somebody on the Panthers, uh, I guess this Christian McCaffrey guy is pretty decent. I might start him. Um, no, obviously, if you have McCaffrey, he started everywhere. But I like DJ Moore. I still think he's a solid receiver. He's still a guy that I'm going to throw in there as my wide receiver, too, and feel okay with it. So uh, that's not too much else on the Panthers unless I'm forgetting somebody. Um, my question is Robbie Anderson, um, because he only had one catch and it went for a touchdown in week one. I expected a much heavier workload from him, similar to last year, where it was the one a one B with him and DJ Moore. Do you think this happened to be a game plan that took Robbie Anderson out of week one or what, what do you think the deal is? I don't know if it was a game plan or not. I mean, I'm not too worried about it long-term for Robbie Anderson I think there'll be you know there could be game plans where he's more involved I think typically they're both reliable starters Um, but I did find interesting when doing the article for the sit and start weeks and Robbie Anderson actually made the sit list because he only averages seven and a half points in his last two games against the Saints since he came to Carolina so definitely something to keep an eye on like the Saints have seemed to figure out a way to take him out of the game I mean, it's a different quarterback now. It's a different year. The Saints are incredibly banged up at the secondary. They lost Marshawn Lattimore after Sunday. But shout out to him for that huge contract extension. I don't think we talked about that at all, but because he's a defensive player and fantasy is more offensive heavy. But shout out to him. Huge contract. But they're banged up in the secondary, so you think that he would be a start. Um, But I might be a little bit hesitant. But DJ Moore, those eight targets, he's definitely in my starting lineup this week. You know, I... I find it funny that you said that Robbie Anderson only averaged like seven point some points per game last year. Cody and I, you, you you and I both just had weeks in fantasy in certain leagues where seven points from a receiver would have been a blessing because we just had absolutely (laughs) just crap the bed. We weren't even, we didn't even show up. I know my fantasy team didn't show up in most leagues. So uh, seven points actually sounds nice, but normally that is pretty low. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to the next game. We got the Los Angeles Rams and the Indianapolis Colts. Um, I'm still going to be a Matt Stafford hater, and I'm going to do it all year. I don't think his week one was that impressive. Everyone else thought he was um, 
you know, playing like Peyton. And I think it's ridiculous, but we're going to see him in a tougher matchup this week because the Colts defense is a lot better um, than what he got to face. Stafford could be a potential starter in fantasy for your quarterback, but he's probably not the guy you want to throw in there. You probably drafted someone above him that you like better. Um, Also on the Rams, you got Cooper Cup. If you have him, you're obviously starting him. If you have Robert Woods, you're probably starting him. Don't like it as much. Um, But the guys I'm curious of, would you start Van Jefferson? We saw a good week from him. And would you start Gerald Everett at tight end? Gerald Everett doesn't play there anymore. It's Tyler Higby. That's what I meant. My bad. Tyler Higby. But I had to call you out because I'm still kind of irritated how you just like dogged Matt Stafford for his performance. I was like, oh, it wasn't very good. So uh, Matt Stafford, he played great. I, we're not going to get into the Matt Stafford debate right now. We've already gone a little long in this episode. We're going to keep ch- chugging through. Uh, but yes, I would start Tyler Higby. Uh, tight ends are so hard to find outside, honestly, the big four. So he's in a high-powered offense. He gets targets. You're going to just start him. Like, if you didn't draft one in the first four rounds, well, you're probably not going to have a tight end that scores more than 10 points most weeks, unfortunately. So just live with it. I like Higby. And I just want to point out Daryl Henderson. You know, we talk, everyone was like, oh, Sony Michelle, they traded two picks to get him. He was nowhere to be found until the fourth quarter. I don't know if that – some people might be like, well, he's still trying to learn the offense. I mean, he's had three weeks to get up to speed. You saw Latavius Murray on Monday night have three days and was splitting carries. Daryl Henderson and is the guy in LA. He has very good value at this moment. The only question and concern with him is how long will it be until he gets hurt? Hopefully he can make it all season. That would be amazing for him and my fantasy team. But Daryl Henderson, great look. I don't remember the second part of your question on the receiver that you asked. I think was it Van Jefferson? Van Jefferson. Yeah, I was going to touch on Van Jefferson if you want. Take to it away, George. All right. Um, I am not starting Van Jefferson in this matchup. I think if there's a plus matchup or a situation where, say, there's a really good number one corner, like if they were to go against Green Bay, you might see either Woods or Cup get locked out. In that case, you're going to see Van Jefferson get more work right here in a good against a good defense. Nothing like that happening. I, I would not play him. He may be worth a speculative ad for your bench, but I don't think he's going to be consistent every week starter for anybody. Yeah, I mean, we saw what Josh Reynolds did when he was there as the number three. He put up some decent points. He was pretty consistent, but he never put up the kind of points that you wanted to pick him up immediately and start him. Um, But Van Jefferson, I definitely think, has upside over Josh Reynolds. I think he's a better receiver. Um, So maybe later in the year he can emerge, especially if there is an injury to Copper Woods. Hopefully there's not. I love both of them. Um, But what about on the Colts side? Uh, Carson Wentz didn't play bad. I mean, he didn't light the world on fire, but he didn't play bad. Uh, We talked that Marlon Mack was nowhere to be found, but Jonathan Taylor still wasn't as impressive as we were hoping. Um, As far as receivers, uh, again, is there any Colts receiver you actually feel comfortable starting in this week? I don't. I think I'm looking more at the running backs. I think Taylor's probably going to be a start for you most weeks because of where you took him. And because of the matchup, I think L.A. is going to put up a lot of points like they typically will. It could be a good Naheem Hines flex game. We talked about it earlier this week where that could be a backfield that brings in two starters some weeks. This could be a week to get Naheem Hines because they're, they're playing from behind. He's going to get a decent amount of catches out of the backfield. Yeah, I agree with that. I like Neom. Ne- ne- um. Man, I cannot say <laughs> players' names today. Naheem Hines, hey. I like him this week. <laughs> I also like Jonathan Taylor. He looked good. He had, And Jonathan Taylor, you know, we think Naeem Hines is the pass-catching option, but Taylor still had seven targets, six receptions, 60 yards. So he was definitely heavily utilized. It seems to be a big portion of their offense, at least for now, is the running backs are pass catchers. I mean, no one's starting Jack Doyle. His days of being a tight end, that fantasy relevant, are beyond over. If you're going to make me start a Colts wide receiver at this moment, it's going to be – Zach Pascal. I mean, I still like Pittman. I think he can come on by the end of the season. Like, don't cut Pittman yet. That's just my personal opinion. Some might agree. I'd stash Pittman for a few more weeks. But outside of the running backs, that, that Colts offense is heavily utilizing them, and I would avoid anyone else on that offense for now. 
All right, I think you uh, summed it up pretty nicely there. So why don't we go ahead and move on to a divisional matchup? We got the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins. Um, I think the Bills are heavily favored in this matchup, and you're going to start your obvious guys like Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs. Um, but Zach Moss was a healthy scratch last week, and Devin Singletary played well. Are we comfortable starting Singletary? Uh, if Zach Moss is playing this week, do you? think about starting him um do you think about starting emmanuel sanders cole beasley any of those guys gabriel davis even they had four receivers that were involved last week and even though singletary was essentially the only running back to get touches he got i think it was 11 carries last week the bills have proven since their times late last year that they're just not going to be a team to run the ball much If Zach Moss is inactive and you are running back desperate, like really desperate, you may want to start Singletary in the hopes that he happens to get a touchdown or pop a couple of 15 yard runs. But I would be more confident if you're talking flex and you're talking Singletary versus Davis or Cole Beasley. I would much rather start one of the two wide receivers because I feel like they can get almost as much work in targets and catches as Singletary well in carries. Okay, well, see, I see. I tend to like Singletary <laughs> a little bit better if he uh, doesn't have Zach Moss there. He did have 11 carries. He got 72 yards out of it. He averaged 6.5 yards per carry on the Steelers' defense. He still saw uh, three or he had three receptions on five targets, so he was still utilizing the game. Uh, I understand, you know, it might be a flex option. Hopefully it's not your running back one or two unless you've been desperate for injuries. But, you know, let's talk about some guys that we mentioned a little bit earlier. Like, what if Josh Jacobs is out? Devin Singletary, Kenyon Drake. If Zach Moss is out and Josh Jacobs is out, we're saying that. Because if Zach Moss is playing, I still don't trust it, and it's an easy Kenyon Drake for me. Um, If... They're both out. I would probably still lean Kenyon Drake a little bit, mainly because of the fact that I think the Raiders are going to be playing from behind and Kenyon Drake is a pass catching back. Um, But it is close. I do think Singletary is worth a look if you have that situation. I would also probably lean Kenyon Drake, but that that's a tough question. That's a good one. And just for the record, they both tied with for RB27 last week with nine and a half points and half point PPR. So that's why I picked those that's two. That's with one of them starting, the, one of them playing slightly more than a backup role because <coughs> Jacobs played but was hurt. Correct. Kenyon Drake um, had five less carries, but he had two more catches. So it was about the same. And one played the Steelers defense and one didn't. But who who are they even playing? I am so lost. Oh, the Miami Dolphins. That's right. Miami <laughs> Dolphins. The, I love Miles Gaskin. And everything in my bo- my body tells me to start Miles Gaskin, except my head. My head's like, uh, uh, I probably wouldn't start Miles Gaskins this week. What are your guys' thought on the whole Miles Gaskin situation? I mean, he looked he looked good. He was he was the guy, but again, he he didn't get in the end zone. He had 11 carries last week, or I'm sorry, he only had nine carries last week, but he did have five receptions. So 10 points fantasy week without scoring is pretty decent for, you know, a mid-tier running back, but he has the bills this week. So what are your guys' thoughts? I don't love it. I'm not a big Gaskin fan this week. If I have to start him, I will. Um, But, you know, there's so many mid-level running backs that you're kind of sketchy on this week. Uh, I know I was asking you guys earlier, like Daryl Henderson, Miles Gaskin. um, I mean, there were some other guys I threw in there too, but there's so many like mid-level guys around that pick that uh, Miles Sanders, that was the other one, that you kind of just have to go with your gut. And I've said this before, and – if you go with your gut and you're wrong, well, at least you know you tried your best. If you go with, if your gut is telling you start Miles Gaskin, but you know you Google it and it says Miles Sanders, and everything in you is saying Gaskin, but uh, online says Sanders. If Gaskin ends up going off, and you would have won if you started Gaskin, you are going to hate yourself more 
than if you would have started Gaskin and you were wrong. You'd be like, ah, well, at least I tried. So go with your gut. If you have one of those mid-level guys, you can reach out to us. We can give you some advice. If your gut's telling you one guy, go with it. And don't go off of a random generator name generator wheel because that we see how that worked with me between Tyler Lockett and Brandon Ayuk last week. Great. And then real quick, Miami Dolphins, real short, Mike Kosecki, he goose egged in week one. Does that scare you at all? Are you again, we know how the tight end market is. Are you willing to put him back out there? You pivoting. What are your thoughts? Keep him on your team, but don't start him. That's all I got. Yeah, to there's say at about least him. twelve tight ends. There's at least twelve tight ends I like better than him this week, but I wouldn't cut him. All righty, New England Patriots, New York Jets. I feel like this is like a matchup that's always hyped, but it's been one sided for many <laughs> years. Who are your favorite players? I'll let you pick either team. I mean, there's a lot of players to pick from. Is there any guys that stand out? On the Jets side, I'm going Corey Davis. He's my guy, and it's not just because I'm a Titans fan and I have three Corey Davis autographed jerseys. It is because Corey Davis looked like a true number one receiver. He looked great in that offense. He was pretty much the only guy Zach Wilson was able to hit because I don't think Zach Wilson is quite there yet as an NFL quarterback. And on the New England Patriots side, I'm going Damian Harris. Uh, We were worried about... You know, Ramondre Stevenson was so good. That's why they got rid of Sony Michelle. Stevenson was nowhere to be found. Damian Harris controlled the game, uh, was able to create space, make guys miss, and he was heavily utilized in the game. So uh, those are pretty much the only two that I like in this matchup. Um, I'll start with the Patriots side, and you already said Harris. I think Harris should be in a lot of people's starting lineups after seeing his workload in week one, but I'm going to go to somebody else and There's a big debate between Jacoby Myers and Nelson Aguilar this week. I, if I had to pick one of them, I'm going Nelson Aguilar. Um, I know Cody, you had mentioned something about Jacoby Myers in your article as well as Corey Davis. So do you want to hit both of them here? Nope. I want you to go to the couchgms.com and check it out for yourself. (laughs) Shameless plug. I like it. No, that's good. That's good. I like it. So if you guys want to find out who you should start between those two, go check out what Cody wrote and spent hours and hours getting together last night. Go check it out. Um, Why don't we go ahead and move on to the next matchup because we are definitely uh, spending too much time on some of these guys. The Cincinnati Bengals and the Chicago Bears. You got Joe Mixon. You're starting him. Um, But the question with the Cincinnati Bengals every week is Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase. Which one are you starting? Round one went to Jamar Chase, but I still think, like last week, the person I'm most confident starting week to week right now is Tyler Boyd, but I'd be much more confident than I was last week starting Jamar Chase if you were in that situation. Yeah, I think I think the safest guy on the, the roster is T. Higgins. I think it's going to go back and forth between Tyler Boyd and Jamar Chase on who is the top guy. Like I think T. Higgins will be wide receiver too, pretty much. The whole it'll just go back and forth between those. For me, I'm taking Tyler Boyd this week as well. Again, maybe Jamar Chase will prove me wrong. He looked really good in week one. Uh, Friend of the show, cousin Chance, Bengals fan. We had to watch that whole game. So had a lot of eyes on that one. Good to see the Vikings lose last week by their kicker, which, and I hate saying this because I still need a kicker for this week. And it's a guy I'm probably going to pick up. But rookie Evan McPherson. Dude has a cannon for a leg. So I know I'm anti-kicker. If you're playing with kickers, you should tell your commissioner to get them out. Uh, But if you need one, I do like Evan McPherson this week. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely. And, you know, going on the Bears side every week, I'm just going to hope that it's a Justin Fields kind of game. I'm going to hope that he steps in there and starts because once he does, Justin Fields is going to be an every week starter at quarterback, in my opinion. He's that electric. Um, Although he did break my heart a little bit. Last week, I was watching that game and I was saying, why is Justin Fields on the bench? Yes, he plays a little couple plays here. Why is Andy Dalton starting? He shouldn't be starting. And then Justin Fields was talking about how Andy Dalton came out onto the field for the team he's supposed to be playing for, and his own fans were booing him before he even took a snap, and that's not fair to him. And, man, it made me feel bad for Andy Dalton there. Um, Look, if you are a Bears fan, if Andy Dalton is out there on the field 
you should still cheer for him. He is still your starting quarterback. Whether you like it or not, you are not the head coach. We are couch GMs. We're not real GMs. We don't get to make those decisions. So you should still cheer on your starting quarterback. However, I do hope Justin Fields comes out soon. Anyway, moving on to the rest of the team. David Montgomery, I feel like, is a clear starter. You're not going to bench David. Uh, Allen Robinson, um, guys, Pro Football Focus posted a chart of Allen Robinson's route tree from the game, and it was terrible. He didn't run any routes. It was They limited his playbook so much. He ran little hook routes and little slants. He never went deep like at all. He didn't have any intricate routes at all. You have a guy who could potentially be a top 10 receiver in the NFL with his skill set, and you're just not even going to run any plays with him. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to believe it's because of the quarterback transition, because Andy Dalton is still in his first year with the Bears, and he's still learning the playbook. Justin Fields, when he gets in, is still going to be obviously a rookie in his first year in the system. I'd like to believe it's that because it's not even like it's a new coach. Allen Robinson's been used heavily in the past and run plenty of different routes. It's got to be a quarterback playbook situation. I hope that expands in the next few weeks now that some of these guys are going to get more practice time in the system and everything else. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, it's week to week. If you look back to a few games last year, the same thing was going around with DeAndre Hopkins in Arizona. Like he was only running five yard out routes on the left side for like a whole game. (laughs) I don't know what that was about. Sometimes the game plan is awful. Uh, But yeah, the guys that you drafted from Chicago, you're playing. The Bengals, good luck on the wide receivers. We're all going to pick a different one. Uh, But I think they're all have potentially could be all starters this week. Uh, But like we've mentioned numerous times, we got to keep this thing moving. Atlanta Falcons, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. uh, This game could be ugly. The Falcons aren't very good. (laughs) Like, okay. Uh, I'll I'll just I'll jump right into this one then. There's a lot of Buccaneers receivers that did well last week. One of them was not Mike Evans. We think Mike Evans is healthy, but you're saying this game could get ugly. Are you worried about starting any Bucks receiver just because they could get up so big? Uh, nope, nope, okay. not at all. You now remember it's the last year when, part. They, when you play the Rams, or no, I'm sorry, when they played the Lions, and like Brady threw like five touchdowns in the first half and then like didn't play. Like oh yeah, season. yeah. Okay. Yeah, this game could be similar to that. So, like, you might Mike Evans' day day might be done by the mid third quarter. Um, maybe I'm over talking this game a little bit. It is divisional, and they're always play a little bit tighter. Uh, So, but I have no confidence. I we told you on Monday about the Ronald Jones thing where we stand with him. So the receivers, Brady, even Gronk, I'm fine with. The Falcons, Calvin Ridley, everyone else, no. Yeah, That's I'm still starting Mike Kyle Davis Pitts. if you guys didn't catch that. <laughs> I'm still starting Kyle Pitts because, you know, the tight end market is so thin that my only other tight end is Jonu Smith, and I still don't even feel confident in that. So um, between the two, I like Pitts a little bit better, but, yeah, my tight ends are rough. Happens to the best of us there because the tight end position is a mess. But I think that pretty much covers that one, so we're going to move on to the next game, the Minnesota Vikings at the Arizona Cardinals. Biggest question to me. Wait, I think Chandler Cardinals Jones got another sack. Yeah. Chandler Jones getting five more sacks. No. <laughs> Guys, I just want to um, point out, I did see a thing. So Taylor Lewan made a comment after the last game that uh, he sucked thanks to Chandler Jones for exposing him and everything. However, after that, to anybody out there that doesn't know, Taylor Lewan and Will Compton started a podcast called Bussin' with the Boys where they interview different NFL players. They talk about football, talk about life. And a video clip surfaced from Bussin' with the Boys this past week, where Taylor Lewan is talking to um, fellow Titan Jeffrey Simmons, and they were going over this college game where Jeffrey Simmons had five sacks in one game. And Taylor Lewan spoke up and said, wow, five sacks in one game? If I was the head coach of that team... I would be punching that offensive lineman that gave that up. That quarterback, I'd probably never talk to him again. That guy sucks. This video surfaced of him saying all this stuff right after he gives up five sacks in one game to Chandler Jones. So it is not looking good on Taylor Lewan right now. Um, He he jinxed himself so bad. (laughs) Yeah, it's not good. Uh, But Chandler Jones is a monster. It's kind of hard to – I mean, I blame – Lawan, he did terrible, but 
Chandler Jones is going to feast all year. He is an absolute animal, and this Cardinals defense is insane. My favorite play, other than Kyler Murray, in this entire matchup is the Cardinals defense. I like them this week. Again, they have so many playmakers. If you need a defense, Cardinals are out there. Throw them in your lineup. Don't be afraid. Other than that, I mean, you have your obvious guys like Dalvin Cook. You're going to start Adam Thielen. You're going to start Justin Jefferson. Uh, You're going to start on the Cardinals side. DeAndre Hopkins is going to be a starter, but we did see, um, yeah, Rondale Moore. He had some electric plays. Christian Kirk, he had some electric plays. We saw a split between Chase Edmonds and James Conner. One receiver, one running back. Cody, you got receiver. George, you got running back. Which one do you like better? Go ahead, Cody. Oh, you're going to put me on the spot. Maybe we go first. I'm taking Christian Kirk still. I still think it's a little too early for Rondell Moore. I'm not expecting two touchdowns for Christian Kirk like he had last week. Uh, That might be a little bit tough to uh, replicate. You know, you typically don't chase fantasy points. I feel like saying Christian Kirk is what I'm doing, uh, but I still like his volume potential for now. Now, on Sunday after this game, I'm sure Ronald, Rondell Moore might have like one catch for 75 yards and a touchdown. If that happens, so be it. But Christian Kirk should be more reliable. I'd like to think when it comes to the running backs that the Vikings are going to keep this game a little bit closer than last week's game was against the Titans. I don't think the Cardinals are going to win every single game 38 to six or whatever it was. Um, And I like to think if the game's closer, it's going to feed better to chase Edmonds. Chase Edmonds is also the bigger big play guy. Connor got a lot of carries last week, probably because they were milking the clock. I would lean Edmonds, not confidently. So you, you would think Edmonds is the better running back, but you're not starting him? Yes, that's what I would go. Yeah, and then just to keep in mind on this game, uh, Eric Kendricks, Anthony Barr, Everson Griffin, all might not play this week. So Big run stuffers for the Vikings. That's some big, and they're two best linebackers for sure. So keep an eye on the injuries for that one. We'll keep you updated on inactives on Sunday over on Twitter. So make sure you're definitely watching that one. Tyler, I know you've been waiting a very long time to talk about this next team. (laughs) I'm sure you have. I mean, I know it wasn't great on week one. The Seattle Seahawks, your favorite with good old gum chewing Pete Carroll (laughs) taking on your Tennessee Titans. Julio Jones. I will take this whole game away right here, and then we can move on to the next matchup unless you got something you want to throw in here. Look, on the Tennessee Titans side of the ball, Derrick Henry, are you worried about him? Absolutely, because he starts slow in the beginning of the year. But if you have Derrick Henry, you're not benching him. You're starting him. Throw him in your lineup confidently. I am in a league where I have uh, Christian McCaffrey, Nick Chubb, and Derrick Henry, and I can only start two of them. In a rare situation like that, I'm benching Henry. Uh, Any other situation? He's starting. Don't be afraid. A.J. Brown, he is the guy. We were thinking Julio might be the number one over A.J. He's not. A.J.'s the number one. He's got the connection with Tannehill. Start A.J. Brown. Um, Julio Jones, he had three drops in that game, and his catches were nothing spectacular. Um, I'm still happy the Titans have Julio, but he's making some mistakes. He's not up to par with Tannehill yet. If you can, bench Julio can't believe I'm saying that makes me want to throw up but if you can bench Julio um there's really not much else to start on this team I'm so sorry but my dog chewing a bottle in the background if you can hear that um (laughs) he's extra Ferkser not starting him at tight end love the man not starting him on the Seattle Seahawks side of the ball now the Titans were able to finally get a little bit of pass rush uh they were able to stop the run a little bit but it wasn't great. Chris Carson still a solid starter at running back. As far as the receivers, you have Christian Fulton is going to be shadowing DK Metcalf. They played in college. Uh, they have a little bit of a rapport with each other. It was a good matchup. I still think DK is going to be fine. Um, but Janoris Jenkins, the Jackrabbit, who I am not a huge fan of is going to be shadowing Tyler Lockett. I think it's going to be a huge Tyler Lockett game. Um, I think he's the number one receiver over DK Metcalf this week. If you have Lockett, throw him in your lineup. Um, yeah, that's 
pretty much my breakdown for this game. I mean, if you have Russell Wilson, you're obviously starting him. If you have Gerald Everett, uh, you're probably starting him as well because the Titans can't cover a tight end. I'll put you on the spot really quick. Just uh, going back to your, if you can, bench Julio Jones talk. Mm -hmm. League of record. I've got Calvin Ridley. He's in my lineup. I've got Tyler Lockett. He's in my lineup. Flex position. It's Julio Jones, Tyson Williams, Nelson Aguilar, Brandon Ayuk. Ayuk's pretty much gone. So Julio, Tyson Williams, Nelson Aguilar. Who would you start? Hmm. You know, I like Aguilar. I think he's good. I don't think I would start him over Julio Jones. I think I still would have Julio ranked above Aguilar. But honestly, based off of the usage, I'm leaning Tyson Williams. I really liked what he did this past week, and I think he could be technically the number one running back for that system. Yes, that he could split with Devontae Freeman. Yes, he could split with Latavius Murray. But the Ravens like to use multiple running backs. I think Williams could be the guy he could feast um, I'm probably leaning Tyson Williams until Julio shows you that he has a connection with Tannehill. Um, just know that by doing that, you are risking that potential. Julio has six catches for 150 yards kind of game. Um, that is always a possibility with a guy like him. All right. That's a good job to wrap up that game. And we can move on then to the last four o'clock game, which would be the Dallas Cowboys at the Los Angeles Chargers. So take it away, George, your two favorite teams. <laughs> I am offended that you put favorite and Dallas in the same sentence. N no. Um, I think the biggest question I have is what's going to happen with the Dallas wide receiver core now that Michael Gallup goes down. I still think we're just starting two. Amari Cooper, C.D. Lamb. I don't look at anybody past that. Um, Dalton Schultz is a great play this week. I'm pretty sure I uh, mentioned him in my waiver wire pickups earlier this week. He would be probably someone who I would think about starting over. He's also in my like article as a start of the week. So we're on the there same wavelength there with Dalton Schultz. <laughs> so make sure you go over and check that out. And I know Tyler said that he was struggling at tight end. If Dalton Schultz is someone that's out there on the waiver wire, I would consider that over a Kyle Pitts or a John U. Smith this week. On the Charger side, I would also consider a Jared Cook in that situation as well. He Gross. could be a sleeper. Other than that, the traditional guys that uh, you start on the Chargers are probably who I'm going with. Yeah, I just, I mean, you're starting Austin Eckler, but are you guys surprised that he had zero targets in week one? A little bit. I don't. I feel like he's never had a game that he's been used that heavily and never caught a ball. Yeah, it was definitely interested, interesting to see, see there. But I think. Those are what you guys said. That's who you're starting. Keenan you know, Allen. This is going to sound Jared Cook. This is going to sound weird, but it actually kind of likes makes me like Austin Eckler more that he wasn't targeted. Now I understand PPR formats. You want him to get the ball thrown to him and everything, and I expect him to get the ball thrown to him more this off season. I think week one is going to be an outlier, but it really makes me respect Austin Eckler and feel more confident with him knowing that he can be a solid running back despite not being used in the passing game. If he's used solely running the ball, he can still be useful. That makes me feel more confident starting him uh, in the future. It's just kind of a little weird blurb there. But, yeah, guys, let's go ahead and move on to Sunday night football. Should be a pretty good game. I think we know who's going to win, in my opinion. Uh, but we got the Kansas City Chiefs at the Baltimore Ravens. And, you know, the Chiefs, you have your obvious guys. You're going to start Mahomes, Kelsey, Tyree Kill. Um, Clyde Edwards-Alaire is most likely in your starting lineup, although he's not a thrilling running back. He's still a decent running back. You're going to put him in there. Uh, Baltimore Ravens side, you're starting Lamar. Um, but as far as the receivers, Marquise Brown actually surprised and looked pretty good in week one. Are you starting him? Or are you starting any of the other Baltimore receivers? What are you doing there? Um, he's somebody that's on my radar to uh, pick up because I feel like he was undrafted in most leagues. And if Lamar's really going to look like he did as a passer in week one, the rest of the season, Marquise Brown immediately jumps onto the radar. And we have to also see what happens with Rashad Bateman when he comes off of the IR, hopefully in week four. But so Hollywood Brown's always been someone that they've tried to get involved in the Ravens offense, even when they were not passing the ball more than 20 times a game. So he immediately becomes a factor if Lamar's arm is used a lot more. I'm not starting him yet, though. Um, even though this is a matchup where they could be throwing the ball from behind with the Chiefs probably running up on them. 
Yeah, and he is questionable. He is dealing with a little bit of an injury. Um, but I want to talk about Sammy Watkins. I know it was week one. Sammy Watkins has been notorious for huge week ones. But he did see eight targets. If Hollywood Brown isn't playing because of an injury, like you might want to th- throw Sammy Watkins in your lineup. Or at least, if you're a daily fantasy player, like go get him. He's He's pretty cheap. I can't remember his exact price off the top of my head, but he definitely was a a really low option that a lot of people are saying, go grab Sammy Watkins until he explodes. So Sammy Watkins, definitely a fun pick. I'm trying to read what George is typing to me. That's why I'm stumbling more than over. Oh, Sammy George. Watkins revenge game. I gotcha. It is a Sammy Watkins <laughs> revenge game. We'll have to see how that one plays, plays out. But if they're going to score points, which we expect the Chiefs to put up points and we expect the Ravens to put up points, maybe. That's the big if. I saw Ronnie Staley is now hurt for the Ravens. He's might miss some time. So they're going to have to move Villanueva over to left tackle. They could barely block the Raiders front four. Could be a long day for the Ravens. The Ravens this year, I mean, I, lo- I love them coming into the year, but I hate to say it, but they're feeling like the San Francisco 49ers from last year. Like they're just being destroyed by injuries. They're a good team, but they're not going to make it the long, the whole season. So I'm sorry, Ravens fans. Tyler is probably like jumping for joy that the Ravens aren't going to have a winning record this year if that actually comes true. Not willing to say that yet because they're still coached very well and still have a lot of talent. But just want to get Sammy Watkins out there. Tyson Williams, to George, answer your your last one. I would start Tyson Williams as well. And then Latavius Murray, he definitely was involved, and he got a lot more work in the second half after Tyson Williams blew a blocking assignment to get a sack on Lamar Jackson. So that's something to keep in your mind. You know, that doesn't show up on the stat sheets at all, but when you're watching the games, if your running back can't protect your quarterback in pass sets, he can't be on the field. So Latavius Murray, hopefully you picked him up last week. Don't run out and cut him because they signed Devontae Freeman. Like, he still has value. Keep him on your bench, uh, but not starting him this week. All right, so we got one game left. Uh, You know, George, you got to talk about your Eagles. I got to talk about my Titans. It's time for Cody to go ahead and talk about this game. Now, Cody, I know you're high on the Packers this week, and I know you. we are all low on the Lions this year, despite them putting up good points in week one. Um, so I'll let you d- dive into the game. But before you do, just curious, what do you feel more confident in? Which one would you put $100 on if you had to? The Bucks beating the Falcons? Because they're bad, or the Packers beating the Lions? Which one are you more confident with? Uh, well, one, if I had hundred bucks, I would. Let's <laughs> let's make that caveat very clear. Um, if I was betting, the smart money would definitely be on the Bucks to beat the the Falcons. I mean, personally, as a fan, I'd probably put on the Packers. But if smart money would say would say the Bucks. But to the point of why the Packers are in this consideration is since Matt Lafleur took over. After the Packers have lost a game, Aaron Rodgers, the following game, has been lights out. 6-0 and record, 16 touchdown passes to zero interceptions, aver- averaging 120 passer rating. The dude lights it up. He even said in his press conference uh, on Wednesday that, or I guess it was Thursday because they played the Monday night game, He, they asked him, why are you so good after a loss? And he's like, the averages. I'm, I'm a pretty good player if I want to be get my averages up I got to play better after a loss like I'm not saying that's what he's thinking about out there but it makes sense you know you got to get those averages up I love Rodgers this week Aaron Jones he feasts against the Lions last last season week two ironically also the Packers home opener he had 43.6 fantasy points heavily utilized in the run game part of the passing game the Packers know for their offense to work they have to get the the running game going. Look for Aaron Jones to be featured. Devontae Adams, I don't need to talk about it. You draft him in the first round, you're starting him. But I do want to talk about the Lions running backs. DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams. If you've watched the Packers for any amount of time, you know the running game, giving up yards in the running game, has been their Achilles heel. And DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams were two of the best offensive players the Lions put on the field last week. They had a combined 20 carries. Swift had 11. 
Williams had nine. They both had eight receptions coming out of the backfield. You love that for both half point PPR and full point PPR. They're both starts for me this week. Jamal Williams, DeAndre Swift, I'd get them in your lineup. They, and they both found the end zone as well last week. So Goff is looking for them. They're using them a lot. And then just a fun fact, it's not going to happen this week, but because Jamal Williams was such a loved Packer, he is 35 carries away from breaking the NFL record for most carries without a fumble. A guy we don't really talk about, but that just goes to show you how reliable he is, how, you know, that's why he gets carries. That's why he's even competing with DeAndre Swift. The dude is talented. He's reliable. So, again, don't be afraid to start DeAndre Swift or Jamal Williams this week in fantasy. Would you think about starting a Detroit wide receiver? Probably Quintez Cephas because no. he led the team in targets. Okay. No. Didn't even let you finish. H- Hawkinson. Hawkinson, and that's it. I mean, because I know Goff had a great game last week, and we talked about Jared Goff maybe being a sleeper quarterback coming up. Somebody has to get those catches. Wasn't sure what you were thinking. No, I I think Cephas has shown that he's the number one. Again, he's going to get paired up a lot with Jair Alexander. I mean, they're going to have to move him around to get Jair off of him. Cornerback two, dear Lord, I hope it's Eric Stokes and not Kevin King this week. But you never know. So maybe – you know, a Tyrell Williams or Amra St. Brown breaks out, but definitely not willing to bet my fantasy week on that, especially again, since it's a Monday night game. So, and you can't, you got, when the running backs are each getting eight receptions a piece, like really wide receiver one is passing option number four on that team. So that is, fair. if you're going to take a flyer receiver on Monday night, it's Marquez Valdez Scantling. Okay. All right, guys. Well, that's all the games right there. Um, Before we close out this show, anybody else you want to hit on? Any other comments you want to make? Any other fantasy advice for the week? No, I think think I'm good. It was definitely a fun show. I'm just glad that football is back. I know I was a little depressed on Monday after the Packers lost, just like Tyler was. Um, But it's fun being back twice a week now. Hopefully you guys are getting a lot more out of it. So, uh, I guess it's time to wrap this up. We record this on Thursday. Thursday Night Football starts in a little bit in 10 minutes. So, here, let's do something fun at the very end. Let's just, like, say the score of the game like we already – man, I can't believe the Giants won that 27-16. <laughs> man, you go 27-16 Giants. I like it. Uh, even though the fact that it, that's really weird because Washington won 28-12. Yeah, I'm going 12. 12 is such I'm a weird score. 12. Where'd you get that 12? It was 28-21. I mean, the Giants got close, but Washington pulled it out in the end. Just mixed up that score a little bit there. All righty, well. I'm dyslexic, though. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, we'll have to wait and see who's right on on that game. But as always, thank you again for listening to another episode of the Couch DMs Podcast. And guys, Listen, my only advice that I would give you before I close up here is just because you lost week one, or even if you already know you're going to lose week two, your season is not over. It's a long season. You can build your team back up and shoot for that championship. A lot of times the guys who win the championship aren't the guys who make it as the number one seed. So just keep fighting, keep making moves, make trades. Trades will help build you back up. And if you're curious on who would help you get back up, who you should start, who you should pick up, who you should trade. Reach out to us. Let us know. Ask your questions. You could even uh, post on the message boards, and we will help figure it out. Maybe we'll even bring somebody onto the podcast this year and see what we can do to help fix their team. Either way, it's going to be a lot more fun for us and more fun for you if you get involved, so please do so. And thank you one more time for listening in to this week's episode of the Couch GM's podcast. Enjoy week two, everybody. We'll be back early next week to break down everything you need to know in waivers. Enjoy week two. We'll see you all soon. Boom.